I'd like to um, introduce Rich Densel from Van Gogh Greenhouses. Um, he's going to spend the next 25 minutes or so um, telling you all about his experiences um, with Becker um, plants for aphid control. Um, Rich, it's all yours. All right, Brian. Thank you. Um, just a little disclaimer before I start. If some of my slides do not look professional, because I'm not a professional photographer, nor am I a professional speaker. I'm a grower. Everything I say and show during a session uh, just comes from my experience in the greenhouse. My intro into the wonderful world of biocontrol agents came back in 2005, and it was not exactly a smashing success. I decided to release several thousand adult ladybugs into my mum crop, which was infested with aphids. After several days, whatever ladybugs were not lying upside down between uh, my mums, they had migrated onto a neighboring field where apparently the aphids tasted better than the ones of my mums. Well, what happened? Let's ignore for a moment that the fact that I already sprayed my mums multiple times with chemical insecticides and that these ladybugs had probably been vacuum harvested from the wild or most likely in shock when I released them. My first and main problem was that I failed to follow the most important rule in implementing any successful biocontrol program, and that is you must begin at the beginning. Um, if you wait until your greenhouse is full of plants, or worse yet, until you see aphids to begin aphid control, with, um, with an aphid banker system, you're most likely not going to be successful. You must think proactively, not reactively. BCAs, as a general rule, and the aphid banker systems specifically, are preventative, not curative. One other basic rule that applies to pest and disease control in general is to keep your greenhouse clean. Um, remove all dirt and weeds from the greenhouse floor. A dirty floor can be a green breeding ground for all kinds of pests. I hose the floor down bec between crops, and at least annually, I'll disinfect it by spraying either a, a zero tall or micro block. Even a 20% bleach can, can do the trick. Uh, also, keeping weeds away from the outside perimeter of your greenhouse will help. If you let pests establish in tall weeds along the outside wall of your greenhouse, they'll eventually begin sampling the smorgasbord inside your greenhouse. Um, a key step in any BCA program is to dip all incoming um, cuttings, liners, etc., to kill any hitchhiking pests. You don't want to inherit other growers' pest problems. Often the first pest to establish in your crop didn't come from outside, but they came from material brought into the greenhouse. It's much easier to prevent pests establishing in your crop when you begin with clean plant material. Um, for dipping this, for dipping my cuttings and the liners, uh, usually in 10 gallons of water, I will use four ounces of Botanigard, some um, one package of 50 million Steiner Nema Feltier. There are a number of different products you can use, um, different brands that you can use. I will also put in four ounces of Root Shield and a half ounce of Essential and an ounce of Companion. Um, I also make, I use a dipping station to make dipping of liners or plug trays a little more efficient. The black container holds the dipping solution, and after being dipped, the trays are placed on the slanted platforms on either side to allow the excess solution to run back into the stock container. Make sure to submerge the entire plant as thorough coverage is necessary for, for best results. I then will allow the plants to sit in the shade for a little while after the, the dipping. Um, Again, if you're dipping, you don't want to use the same stock solution for a number of different um, cultivars. You want to change that stock solution just to avoid spreading diseases to the plants that you're dipping. Um, these first few steps may seem obvious, but these very basic steps can make or break any biological, biological control system. So while starting early and cleanliness and dipping all incoming plant material are good and necessary, let's focus a little bit more on specifically aphid control. Um, I want to explain how I've used aphid banker plants to control aphids in a commercial greenhouse. Uh, this is not the only way to do it, but it's worked well for me for the past nine years. Since we usually begin transplanting pansies from plugs to flats around January 1st, I like to have my banker program up and running by then. I usually start by seeding some organic cherry oats um, prior to Thanksgiving. 
I found that these Jerry Oaks work better for me than some of the other types of seed often used in banker crop production because they don't stretch as much in low light conditions and they're more resistant to powdery mildew. I'll then inoculate the oats with the berry cherry aphids, which are a favorite target of the, the parasitic wasp aphidias. These aphids only produce, only uh, reproduce on monocots, and they won't bother most greenhouse crops. If your greenhouse is too cold this time of year, you can start the banker plant production in your barn or office, any place where you can maintain a temperature of at least 60 degrees. Natural sunlight is not necessary, as these plants don't have to be pretty. They're only being a food source for the aphids. This also works in the summer when greenhouse temperatures are often too high to maintain aphid production. Once I have a good population of aphids, usually after several weeks, I'll buy in some parasitic wasps. Aphidias colomani and um, matricaria are the combination I use. Uh, the combination of these two species will protect against a number of aphid species, including melon, green peach, tobacco, and others. They won't protect against every aphid species, but I'll, I'll discuss why I control those later. This slide shows the basic steps involved in producing aphid banker plants. I'll explain each of these steps as we go, but this gives you a basic understanding how the system works and how easy it is to do. Um, you'll, you'll notice that from the slides, I produce the banker plants in cages instead of the hairnets that you often might see. I tried hairnets for several years, and I wasn't very successful due to the wasps either getting inside the net or parasitizing aphids through the net. Once a single wasp gets into your production, your production is doomed and you need to start over. That's why I prefer the cages. Uh, the ones in these slides are the results of my efforts over the years at coming up with a cage that keeps the aphids inside, the wasps outside, and allows enough air, circulation, and light for the oats to grow well and avoid diseases. The main idea of having cages is not necessarily keeping the aphids in as much as keeping the wasps out. Because the aphidias are so proficient at destroying an aphid population, when the, uh, the aphids need to be reared in a wasp-free environment. When I have a good wasp population in the greenhouse, it's not unusual for me to see dozens of wasps either crawling on or flying around the banker cages trying to get inside. I recommend using at least two cages. One is a backup, just in case a wasp gets in one of them. Um, the only, if the cages are well made, the only time a wasp should be able to get in is when you exchange the pots of oats. A good idea is to put these cages on a shipping cart, and when it's time to open the door and make the exchange of the oats, simply wheel the cart into a barn or some other area where there are not so many wasps flying around. When you're using two or more cages, be sure to keep the aphid populations in each cage separate. For example, when you remove a banker plant loaded with aphids from one cage and shake off some of them onto a freshly sown banker plant, make sure the fresh banker goes into the same cage the other one came out of. This will prevent you from, from unknowingly putting potentially parasitized aphids into the second cage. Um, keeping the population separate allows you to empty and clean out one cage if necessary and start a system with aphids from the other cage. If you're careful, this will rarely be necessary, but if it does happen, at least you can um, continue your production without any downtime. This has only happened to me a couple of times over the years, but when it did happen, I, I was thankful to have a second cage. After initially inoculating the oats with the wasps, it will take several weeks to begin noticing parasitized aphids, also called mummies or aphid balloons. Once I notice a good number of mummies, I then begin spreading the banker plants throughout the greenhouse. It's been recommended to place one fresh banker plant per week in each acre of greenhouse. I usually go heavier, especially early in the season when I have more time and space. The more wasps you produce, the more protection you'll have when aphids start coming into your greenhouse. And I, I don't believe you can have too many of these aphidias flying around. Another advantage to loading up early is if you skip a week or two later in the season due to just being too busy and forgetting, you should have enough of an established population, wasp population, that it won't really matter that much. Remember, this system requires weekly maintenance. This is not something you release once and forget about it. While it does require weekly release of banker plants, uh, the system itself is actually very economical. The only initial investment would be a banker cage, a little bit of seed, and a single banker plant. Just about anyone can be trained to keep this system going. When I make the weekly exchange of oats, I'll remove the oldest oats from the cage. Usually they're about two weeks old, and we'll have enough aphids on them to be removed and to place into your greenhouse. 
and make sure to close the door quickly, shake off some of the aphids onto freshly sown oats and put them into the cage. After about two weeks, those pots of oats will be ready to be placed into the greenhouse. For best results, I found it's best to keep the temperature in your cages from 60 to 80 degrees. Um, keep the aphids breeding at a good rate. This will require keeping the cages out of direct sunlight, especially on warm, sunny days. Um, each week when the banker plants come out of the cages, hopefully loaded with aphids at this point, I put a fresh banker close to one of the older inoculated bankers that are already in the greenhouse, and I'll soon begin seeing mummies on the fresh ones. If done properly, each banker plant can yield hundreds, possibly over a thousand wasps, and can continue producing for about seven months. Um, just do the math. If to buy in as many aphidias as can be produced by one banker cage over the course of one growing season would probably cost in the thousands of dollars. If I didn't have the ability to produce my own aphidias, there's no way I would be using them for aphid control. Buying in enough aphidias to get the job done would simply cost too much. This picture just shows an aphid mummy on the left and an aphidias about to sting an aphid on the right. Um, as far as keeping the aphid banker plants I, I usually do not throw the older banker plants out until they are completely dead because even a plant that looks well past its prime can still be producing aphids. I generally keep this system going through September, which usually gives me protection through the mum season. One reason I don't keep the system going year-round is to avoid hyperparasites. They are naturally occurring parasitic wasps that will parasitize aphidias and will occasionally get into your production at some point during the summer or fall. I've seen them in my banker systems on several occasions, but by the time they built up their numbers, my, my banker system was winding down for the year, so I've never really noticed a, um, a big effect. I can usually spot them by looking at the mummies in the greenhouse. As seen in these pictures, an aphidious larva will make a round, smooth-edged exit hole out of the, the aphid mummy, but a hyperparasite exit hole will look more jagged, almost like the larva exploded out of the mummy. Uh, stopping banker plant production for a short time is a good way to prevent hyperparasite, hyperparasites from establishing in a greenhouse. Since aphids do not establish on poinsettias, I usually use this time to give my aphid banker system a break. Where there's no food, there will be no aphids, and where there are no aphids, there will be no aphidias. Where there are no aphidias, there won't be any hyperparasites. And then I just start the whole system over again um, for the next uh, pansy season. One thing to keep in mind is while a bit of aphidias population will generally keep aphids under control, you'll still get an occasional hotspot. Uh, it's been my experience that given enough time, the aphidias will find and control most hotspots. For example, I started growing hydroponic cucumbers several years ago and, and I found out very quickly aphids love cukes. I found several hotspots similar to the, the one in the picture here. The first picture shows part of a hotspot as I found it. Notice there are already four or five mummies on that leaf. Um, the second picture is about two weeks later when 20% of the aphids had, had been parasitized. The bottom picture was taken about four weeks after the first. And as you can see, every aphid on the leaf has been parasitized. Uh, to find aphids, you'll need to scout. The, the yellow sticky cards will show fungus gnats, thrips, and other things. But to really find aphids, especially early on, you're going to need to scout the actual crop. They generally hang out on the underside of leaves or at the tips of the new growth. I've also learned to use sparrows um, to help me in locating aphids. Last April, I noticed several sparrows pecking at some zania flats. I looked closer and saw about a dozen flats loaded with aphids. When I looked a little closer, I saw several mummies among the aphids. And I also noticed hundreds of aphidias flying just above the canopy. The aphidias had apparently found the aphids at least two or three weeks before I did and were, were already working on them. Because of the amount of aphidias I saw, I didn't do anything except keep an eye on the situation. Within three weeks, the only sign we had of aphids at one point was a bunch of mummies on the underside of the gazania leaves. The aphidias had completely cleaned up the aphids and the gazanias had actually become banker plants. These are just two examples um, that I've seen of uh, how effective the aphid banker system can be inside the greenhouse. But sometimes we have an aphid outbreak and we just can't afford to wait until the aphidias do their thing. Um, while chemical insecticides are an option, 
they shouldn't always be the first thing we reach for when we need a quick cleanup. If the outbreak has only affected a few plants, they can be removed by um, they can be removed and either disposed of or isolated to give the aphidias uh, time to work on it. They may eventually be able to be used as banker plants themselves. You can also release ladybug or lacewing larvae into the hot spot. They're voracious feeders, and one larva can eat up to several hundred aphids. Um, sometimes when I get a little down with my um, aphid banker system, I don't feel it's working properly. I like to just take a look at a video like this. This is a lacewing larva just ripping into an aphid. It usually cheers me up. Um, another thing to be aware of is what kind of aphid you're seeing in your plants. If the offending aphid of one of the larger species, say like a foxglove or potato aphid, then it would be best to release some aphidolitis into the greenhouse. Uh, since they're active hunters, I generally release a small amount preventatively twice in the spring and once in the late summer, early fall, and I've not had any problems with the larger aphid species. It's easy to tell if the aphidolitis are doing their job because you'll notice the orange larva on the leaves, usually among dead, shriveled up aphids. If you must use a chemical insecticide, try to do it in a way that will have a minimal effect on your aphidias and other BCAs. Many insecticides, as we heard already today, are said to be compatible with BCAs. However, compatible does not always mean harmless. It often means a particular chemical will not kill all your BCAs, just some of them. Endeavor, which happens to be my spray of choice for aphids when I'm in a bind, actually has a negative impact on aureus and adult aphidias. I recently found several lines of calibercola baskets with aphids two weeks before they were scheduled to ship. I knew the aphidias were present and working, but I also knew it would take them longer than two weeks to really clean up the aphids. Since the aphids were still contained and did not yet have wings, I simply spot sprayed the baskets that were affected with Endeavor. So I achieved um, a knockdown without compromising my, my aphid banker system or killing off the, the naturally occurring beneficials that had come into the greenhouse from outside. This is just one example of using a chemical insecticide when necessary, but doing so selectively. Um, two last bits of advice if you're planning to begin using the aphid banker system. First, and this may be obvious to most of you, but don't expect to be able to control aphids with a banker system while trying to control other pests with conventional chemicals. It's just not going to work. The aphid banker system is simply one part of the big picture in biological control. It works best when used as part of a holistic approach, relying on BCAs from day one and only using chemicals if absolutely ne um, necessary. Um, the other bit of advice I have, and we've heard this several times today, but it's important, don't do it alone. Um, you wouldn't attempt to overhaul your company's computer system without some good tech support. So don't try to change from conventional chemical use to biological control without getting some help. While there will be some growing pains, your whole experience will be much more pleasant if you have someone pointing you in the right direction along the way. Um, hopefully that person will be able to set you up with a program suited to your needs, will be able to give you encouragement and advice as you implement that program, as well as to talk you off the ledge when you have your hand on the sprayer and you're ready to pull the trigger. And trust me, that will happen at some point. Um, I realize this overview hasn't been exhausted, but I hope in some way it has been able and helpful to some of you who are already working with aphid bankers and encourages those of you who are not yet to at least consider trying it. Well, thank you. OK, thank you, Rich. Um, let me uh, just see what we have for uh, some questions here. Um, do you combine bankers with um, period release of parasitoids or the release of parasitoids only on the, in the beginning of the season? No, I, I, I combine them. I like to, um, I, I use the bankers f f right from day one, so I do like to combine them, yes. Okay. Let me just... Uh, Look at these questions again. Um, do you think about the, the effect of residual pesticides coming from propagation sources and, and you using uh, BCAs? 
Yes, that's another thing, and Ron, Ron had talked about that too. Um, that is a that can happen, and again, it's best to communicate with the the, the different greenhouses, your suppliers, where you're getting these um, either liners or cuttings from. I have found a number that are already using biological controls, and I tend to retry as much as possible to get our cuttings and our liners from sources that are already using the, the, the biological controls. That would eliminate potential problems of, this, of um, trying to get the beneficials to establish. Okay, somebody had asked about a step-by-step -step, um, recipe for, um, for using banker plants, and, and Joyce has um, posted a, a link to a publication that Stanton Gill has put together on using aphid banker, banker plant systems. So if you look in your chat window, everybody, there's a link to a, a website of Stanton Gill's that has a, a publication there. Um, so Ron is just saying that uh, the best results are achieved if several bankers are used in the same setting, and, and the University of Vermont also has, has uh, some nice information about uh, the bankers um, as well. Um, so another question, do you simply move a pot full of oat aphids or do you introduce, um, introduce predators first? Well, after you, after you start the, the, the little program and you have some aphids on your banker plants and you remove the banker plants from your cage or your hair nets, at that time I'll introduce the, 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 the aphidias. I try to have a good population of, I just call them for lack of a better term, feet eater aphids in the greenhouse already and then I release the aphidias. I release them um, for several weeks in a row and from that point on I don't have to do anything more with releasing more aphidias usually. They will usually, as long as I can release enough aphids, the, the aphidias are going to breed on those aphid banker plants and they will just produce like crazy. The more aphids I can get out of my cages, the more aphidias I will have in the greenhouse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Suzanne put up another uh, um, article about uh, banker plants. Um, question, do, you, do the banker plants need to be sprouted when you start the new colony? Not exactly sure what they're trying to ask there. Well, it, it, in, in general, and I had this problem when I first started, I used to sprout the uh, seeds, give them several days, let the, um, the oats be several inches tall, and then try to inoculate them with aphids. I've had much better success if I put some fresh soil in a pot, put some seeds on top of the soil, watered in, put that plant directly into the banker cage that already has aphids in it. Um, and I found that the first couple days when the seeds are sprouting, um, they're shooting up that little stem, that's when the aphids really like to establish on them. So if you wait too long and the, and the, other, the, the oak plants get too big before you put the aphids on them, it, they're going to have a tough time establishing. I usually see them, put them right in the cage. Um, and to, to help get the aphids to establish, when I take out an older plant from the banker cage, I'll shake off a few aphids onto a freshly sown pot of seed that just puts some aphid right on the pot already and that helps in keeping a good aphid population inside the banker cage. Okay. Um, so um, again with the starting the banker plants, when do you, when are you putting the predator onto the, to the, um, the banker plant? Well, if, if, if by predator you mean the, the, the parasitic wasp, I put them on initially when I'm starting up the system. I only do that several times for the first several weeks. When I take the aphid banker plants out of the cages or out from the hair nets, if you prefer to use hair nets, at that point they only have aphids on them. When they're loaded with aphids, that's a, a good breeding ground for the aphidias. So I'll pull those, cage, those plants out of the banker cage, put them in the greenhouse, and then I will, I will buy in some aphidias and put the aphidias right on the banker plants. And I will do that for two or three weeks, and from that point on, I usually have a very good aphidias population. 
And after that point, once you have, once you start seeing some of the um, the aphid balloons on your banker plants, you no longer need to add aphidias. Um, you just buy them in for several weeks in the beginning, and as long as you can produce aphids as a, a food source for the aphidias, you don't need to add any more at that point. Okay, that seems like it uh, got the the question answered. All right, Rick, Rich, I think we're out of time here. Um, we're gonna take another short. Uh, four minute break or so. Um, coming up at two o'clock is Rick Yates with uh, um, GSS Pro from Griffin Greenhouse Supply. And he's gonna be talking to us about uh, um, using pesticides and are they compatible with a um, biological um, or biocontrol program? Um, thank you, Rich. Thank you. <laughs>